First of all, I want to thank um, Peter and his great team for organising such an amazing event today. Also, for their support throughout our demonstration and our hunger strike, they were there all the time. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I come from Turkish side of Kurdistan, I'm going to say. I'm not going to say Turkey anymore. <laughs> um, where we come from is, for years, we were assimilated. We weren't allowed to study on our own language, as well as, as, well as live in our, own, uh, in our own, own culture. Where we come from, we weren't allowed to listen to our own music. Also, we weren't allowed to study in our own mother language. For years, this, these things were happening. For years, we were banned from many things from our identifi identifications. Many of the times our houses were getting raided. Our parents were getting getting under, uh, taken away. Many of the villages were getting burnt down. There's a lot of misplaced people, a lot of people who died and never came, who went and never came back. Not only in Turkey, but same thing happened in Iran, in Iraq and in Syria. Nowhere in these four parts Kurds ever had their human rights. As a human being, we have the right to speak our own language, to have our Kurdish names, to study on our, in, in our own mother language, to live our culture. But we were banned from those things, basic human rights for years. Just until the PKK movement has came across, to fight against those dominant powers for the freedom of our people. Before I go into Kobane, I want to touch bases on Rojava, because before Rojava, uh, before Kobane, it was the Rojava revolution for two years. Uh, Yepege and Yepege fighters, who are uh, people's defense units and women defense units in Rojava, have been fighting against ISIS for the past two years. Nowhere in the world people have seen this. For two years, it was closed up, the books were closed up, people were pretending to be blind, pretending to be deaf, and they didn't want to see what's happening in Syria, in Rojava. YPG and YPJ were fighting against the whole humanity in Rojava for two years, but it wasn't in the media. No one in the media you could see this. The military equipment that they had was nothing compared to what ISIS and ISIL had. It was basic equipment. But they had the love of freedom. They were fighting with the love and the will of freedom. That's what got them going for two years. After two years, a new era began in, in the Middle East when ISIS took over Mosul. ISIL tried to take over Mosul in June. <coughs> During this time, the Iraqi government and other powers has left Mosul and ran away. And then ISIL moved to Shanghai, uh, to Shanghai where Yazidi people lived, Yazidi Kurds were living in for many years. Also Christians and other ethnic groups as well. Many powers has left those innocent people and ran away because they were too scared of ISIS. And those people whom people are calling terrorists at the moment, or been calling them terrorists for years, have travelled from thousands of miles from their bases to Shanghai to save thousands of people, hundreds and thousands of people. Those are the terrorists, so-called terrorists. But people who were ignoring the genocides and helping ISIS were the good people. When YPG and YPJ, together with HPG and PKK, moved, uh, came across uh, the borders and came to Shanghai, they saved 200,000 people's lives, including Christians, Turkmens, Arabs, Assyrians, and many other ethnic groups. They have opened safe borders for these people to transport these people from the dangerous areas 
to safe areas in Rojava and Turkey. They have risked their lives, so-called terrorists, they have risked their lives to save the life of other people. And these are the so-called terrorists. During this time, Turkish government, so-called non-terrorist government, was trying its best to help ISIS by opening their borders, by opening their hospitals, by supplying them military equipment, and by helping them to kill innocent people. What, has, what PKK and YPG and YPJ forces has done was for the all humanity. For the past 35 days now in Kobani, they have been fighting against ISIS using basic, basic military equipment. ISIS is using equipment from uh, the equipment that they captured from Mosul, heavy equipment that the Iraqi government and US government has left over during, Assad, uh, during uh, Saddam regime. They got hold of all these equipment, all these military, military equipment. Our people are fighting with their love of freedom for 35 days. People thought that Kobani is going to fall, but Kobani didn't fall. Kobani will not fall. No matter how many thousands of ISIS mili militants get transferred from Turkey to Rojava to Kobani, or how many, how many tons of equipment, guns, they trans transfer from Turkey to uh, Kobani, Kobani is not going to fall. Because these people have been fighting for over 35 years to get their freedom, to get their basic human rights. Also, when I touch bases in um, Turkey supporting ISIS, Turkey is actively helping ISIS by allowing grounded ISIS fighters to receive treatment in Turkish hospitals and across back into Syria to re rejoin their fight. They are allowing ISIS to cross border and sell oil from the oil fields in, it controls on Turkey's black market. Blocking the experienced PKK forces from crossing the borders into Syria to defend Kobani to fight ISIS and likewise blocking weapons and other necessary supplies. Last week this was compounded by actively re-engaging in the war against its own Kurds when it bombed PKK positions in southern East Dalaja district. So when all these things were going on in Kobani, Turkey was too busy trying to start the war in Turkey against PKK. They have bombed the area in Oremar, which is the Dalaja district, during all these, uh, all these attacks were happening in Kobani. Over the past 35 days, millions of people were on the roads. Millions of people were on the streets, screaming for those powers to save Kobani. They didn't give up because they were no different to YPG and YPJ, YPJ fighters because they were Kurdish. And also the amazing supporters like Peter and his team, they didn't give up for the past 35 days. There were hunger strikes all over Europe, Australia and many other countries around the world. People were on the streets day by day, day by day, and the numbers were getting bigger and bigger. And U.S. couldn't ignore this. They had to do something about it. Because they knew that Kurds are not going to give up. Until they take an action to save Kobani, to help to get air, air drops in Kobani, we were not going to stop. The reason why USA is so scared to sport Kurds, I guess, is firstly they know the well-trained YPG and PKK forces pro proved the most effective, effective military opponents of ISIS, even when highly outnumbered and outgunned machines were used. So they saw that even though ISIS was using 
very heavy guns and outnumbered uh, militants, they couldn't fight against the Kurds. This was one of the things that changed the uh, United States' mind because they knew no matter how many militants were going into Kobani, it wasn't going to fall. They had to do something because the plan wasn't going on their direction. When we talk about countries who supported ISIS, it's not only Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, US, they're also supporting ISIS. But their plan didn't go accordingly because they thought if we put all those militants and heavy guns in Kurdistan, in Kobane, in Syria, in Rojava, we could get rid of Kurds, but they were wrong. The plan didn't go as they planned. So now they start taking action against ISIS to prove to media, to other people, that they are doing something good for people. But everybody knows that United States and Turkey and Saudi Arabia are the powers behind these people. People who doesn't know anything about humanity, people who doesn't know anything about what human rights is, people who chop people's heads. When ISIS moved into Shanghai, they captured over 5,000 Christian, Yezidi, and other ethnic groups, uh, women from other ethnic groups. These women are being sold, sold in markets for $10, for $20. And we call ourselves humans, and we can close our, so, our eyes to these things when they happen. As a woman, I hate to say I'm a, human, I'm a woman, when all those things are happening to a woman in the Middle East, getting sold in markets as a sex slave. This is just, it's unbelievable. It's unexplainable. Kurdish mothers are crying every single day. They have lost their daughters. Kids are crying every single day because they've lost their mothers. I know for a fact that one of my friends from a city in Shanghai told me all the women were taken away, all the men were killed, and kids were left, to, left alone in two of the towns in Shanghai. And those kids were aged between three months to five, five years. How can these kids live without water, without food? How many days did it take United States government and other governments to put to send humanitarian aid to Shanghai. How many days did it, did it take? So-called terrorist PKK was able to come from a thousand miles away into Shanghai to save those people, but the countries who have all these uh, powers, all these equipments, couldn't send humanitarian aid to Shanghai and they were watching people dying in Shanghai Mountain. Was this possible? Is this a definition of humanity? Is this the definition of democracy? To me, it's not. Because if people can close their eyes to such a genocide in the Middle East, close their eyes to women being kidnapped, women being sold in markets, like thousands of years ago, this is not humanity. This has nothing to do with humanity or democracy. So-called democratic countries can close their eyes to this and call PKK the terrorists. Which terrorists will cross thousands of miles to come into a city to save 100,000 people's life? Who would? I've heard from one of the professors in UTS saying if Australian government helps uh, the Kurdish forces, where are these uh, military equipment going to go? But people, before the United States went into Iraq to Shanghai, before any other countries went into Shanghai, PKK was there, using their own equipment, using their own sources to save human, human beings' lives. And they weren't only Kurdish people, they were Christians, Armenians, Turkmens, Arabs, Shias, Sunnis. So PKK were there from day one, saving thousands of people's lives, but some people are too scared that if PKK get hold of these equipments, these military equipments, they're going to use them in bad ways. 
If PKK really wanted to do this for many years, they would have done it. They wouldn't have came from thousands of miles to save humans' life, which they still do now. Same thing happened in Kobani. For 35 days, when people were saying, Kobani is about to fall, people are flying into Turkey. They were trying to make a safe place for innocent people to go so they can start fighting easily and comfortably because they didn't want to risk innocent people's life. That was the reason, reason why they empty all those villages. So-called terrorists would do this, but so-called democratic country would kill 36 people, if I'm not wrong. During all these things happened, during demonstrations in Turkey, they would kill 36 people, but they're a democrat democratic country. Is this democracy? So-called democracy? If people, are far, if people are on the street, speaking up on the streets, because innocent people are dying in Kobani, they believe in humanity, they need help. But you don't turn around and kill those innocent people. 36 people have died for the past two weeks in Turkey. Hundreds of them have been um, taken away again by the Turkish government. Many of them, we don't even know if they're going to come back. We're in 21st century and these things are happening in the Middle East, in Kurdistan. So I would like to ask you, why do you think people call PKK the terrorists? but not the Turkish state. One, what's the reason? What's the difference between PKK and Turkish state government? No, it's a... No, it's a... Yes, Imperialism, yeah. colonialism, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> so... Yeah? Your, um, your side is... Whatever side you are, freedom fighters, <coughs> defending our democracy, defending this, the other side has to be a bunch of terrorists, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so that the media knows, so that the media knows, people who fight, a, fight against terrorists and who try to save people's lives by risking their own lives are being called terrorists. And they're still in the, on the terrorist list by Australian government and US and other European governments. This is a shame. Shame for humanity. Because our forces, YPG forces, YPG forces are not only fighting for Kurds, but they're fighting for humanity. For all of us. Because we know for a fact that there's a lot of people joining all over the world. The government is hiding this, but we know that close to 600 people have joined from Australia to ISIS. Where have those people been trained? How did they get brainwashed? Who have trained these people? Where are the bases? Does the government know this? Yes, they do. Why don't they find a way to stop it? But they find it too hard to remove PKK from the terrorist list, but they can't find a way to stop people to go and join a terrorist organization that kills people, that rapes women, use them as sex slaves, chops kids' heads off, the government can see this, but they still call the PKK the terrorists? How does this work? Let's not forget, Kurdish freedom fighters have been fighting for over two and a half years, close to three years, for humanity. Not only for themselves. Let's look at Rojava. A simple example of a democratic Kurdistan, I'll say. There's a governance from every single ethnic group. Everyone can live freely. Everyone has right to have their own identity. And everyone can speak their own language. In, three, in those three cantons, you have one representative who is Arabic, Armenian, Christian and Kurdish. So everyone has the right to present their own people. But the countries all over the world are too scared to help people in Rojava, to help YPG because they think 
they, they are terrorists. But don't they see that they're the ones who are saving their lives? I want to touch bases on Kurdish women fighters because I am amazingly inspired by what they're doing at the moment. Nowhere in the world until now we have seen such women fighting against such powers. And those are mothers, sisters, young girls. The FPJ forces are ISIS's biggest nightmare. Biggest nightmare because ISIS have that mentality to, to that mentality saying if we get killed by a woman we won't go into heaven. <laughs> they won't go into heaven because they get killed by a woman. <laughs> so when one of our friends in Rojava has captured one of ISIS militants the, I, uh, the ISIS militant asked, asked him, you know, kill me now. And he's like, why should I kill you now? Because I'm going to go into heaven and you know there's a lot of food and a lot of beautiful girls over there. <laughs> waiting for them. And then he said, no, I'm going to kill you an hour later. And he's like, why? So you can wash the dishes. <laughs> you can get to eat all those good things. There's an amazing revolution going on in the Middle East. And we need to do our best to help those people. Do our best to help those people to save humanity. PKK, YPG, and YPG is fighting for all humanity. It's fighting for, human, for human rights for many years. Let's prove people, everyone around the world, that these are the true heroes, not the terrorists. Thank you.